My name is Barb Cochran. I'm the director of the Duternier Center for Healthy Aging in the School of Nursing. And today I'm representing the Northwest Geriatric Education Center for this talk on age-related changes of the eye. Um, so welcome. And uh, I wanted to remind you that the lectures at the end of this series will be posted on the nwgec.org website. The lectures from last um, term, the winter term, are already posted there and about 50 other lectures from previous years are also posted on that website free and available to you just for the registration. Um, today I'd like to introduce Tiffany Hollenbach. For over a decade she has worked continuously with refractive corneal transplant and cataract surgeons as well as providing primary care comprehensive ocular examinations. Over the years Dr. Hollenbeck has seen an increase in the need for co-management of diseases with primary care physicians and specialists which affect our aging population's eyesight. And welcome. Thanks so much for coming to talk to us about this important topic. Thank you. So this is age-related changes of the eye. And um, we will start with a little bit of an outline of what we're going to review today. Um, we'll start with anatomy so we can get everybody up to speed on what parts of the eye we're talking about. Um, and then we'll talk about all the details of the different places. We'll start with the front surface of the eye, which happens to be where we get dry eye and have eyelid problems. We'll go a little deeper into lens and cataracts, go back to the back of the eye, optic nerve, macular degeneration, and our retina. This is the front surface. Let's see, I'll get my little pointer out here. Way out here. That is the very first place you could touch it with your finger if you wanted to, but don't because it's very sensitive. Right past that corneal service surface, oh, I've got a little ding. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. um, anterior chamber, which is a fluid-filled chamber. Right after that is your iris. That is the part of the eye that has all the different colors. Then we get into the lens. Light passes through the pupil into that lens. I'm, there we go. And past the lens is when you get into your vitreous, which is a jelly-like fluid that holds the eye nice and round. We get back here, which is the nerve. The macula is right next to it, right behind your pupil. And the rest of this red blood vessel area is um, the retina. We'll click that. Oh, looks like the eye is an optic instrument. The um, photo didn't pop in here. Oh, there we go. So as light comes through the front surface of the eye, it's going to change and start to focus towards the back of the retina. The cornea, which is that front surface, does bend the light ray a little bit. And then more of the light rays from your surrounding get into your pupil, where it passes straight through and hits that lens, which is that opaque area. And then at at the lens is really what causes this to focus onto the macula, which is right here. For people who are nearsighted or farsighted, that pinpoint dot does not hit the macula. In nearsightedness, it is before, and in farsighted, it is after, and that's why we wear glasses, to put that dot right back onto the macula. Hmm. Oh, I'm really getting ahead of myself. There we go. What happens when we age? You're going to hear something, um, presbyopia is the term we use for when we cannot focus up close any longer and we start to hold things out further. This, unfortunately, starts to happen between the age of 38 and 60, which a decade ago sounded a little younger or older. Now it seems young. Um, it's due to um, the lens inside your eye soaking up sunlight. And the sunlight breaks down the collagen fibers and starts to make them foggy. So when you get to 60, you can focus at about one to one and a half meters away, past your fingertips. The next about presbyopia is treatment. The treatment options are reading glasses, bifocals, progressives, which is a no-line bifocal. You could wear contact lenses. You can make one eye for distance and the other one for up close, and you can alternate between the two. You can use bifocal contact lenses, which work a lot like the bifocal glasses. There's a segment in the contact lenses that lets you see up close. You can also do nothing, which I often call denial. There's a lot of people who are out in my waiting room, and they're trying to fill out their paperwork. 
And then I ask them how they're doing inside the exam room, and they say, my vision is fine. So with those people, I either have to persuade them to get glasses and make their fine vision even better, or sometimes I have to just let them tough it out until they're ready. If you don't treat presbyopia, the up-close vision becomes worse as the years go by. But it's also true if you treat it. So if you give somebody reading glasses, it's not going to make their focusing better. There's continue, they will continue to lose that focusing and their, their bifocals will have to get stronger. The bottom line is if you get to live past that 40 to 55 year range, you're going to be presbyopic. There is a myth out there that says, Doc, I've heard that if you wear glasses, your vision gets worse, you adapt to it, and you'll always need to wear them. The truth is, you start wearing glasses, you realize how much better your vision is, and you don't ever take them off. So there's that myth. Next part is dry eye, which happens to the cornea. Your patient's complaint or concern will be that their eyes will tear. And so telling them that they have dry eye when their eyes are, will, are tearing seems a little off. And so it does take some education on why that happens. They'll also say that there's a burning sensation. They'll close their eyes and they can feel that burn for a moment. Or just a general feeling that their eyes are tired. Their vision fluctuates from clear to slightly blurry or foggy. And they can be light sensitive. You'll see them wearing sunglasses, sometimes even when they're coming into a room that has windows. The tear film is something that's very difficult for a scientist to try and figure out. We know that we have many layers to it, but really there's a lipid layer, a watery aqueous layer, and mucin layer. And it's the balance of all of that and the little proteins and particles that are inside of it that we haven't really figured out exactly what they are. You'll see hundreds of artificial tears out in the grocery stores, and they're all trying to get this right. Risks of getting dry eye is excessive computer use. And interestingly, there um, has been some research done that say anything after four hours is considered excessive. And I don't know about you all, but four hours is pretty easy to hit in one day. So we're seeing more and more and more dry eyes. The reason for that is when something's really visually intense, you stare. You don't take the time to blink as often as you would if you weren't looking at something that was so visually intense. And that's that. without that blink rate, you're not replenishing the tear film on the front surface. Women get this more than men. Um, increasing age also plays a part. We produce less oils. Our skin gets drier. Um, also, autoimmune, autoimmune diseases, things that make you dry anyway, dry mouth, dry nose, will cause dry eye. And rosacea is more of an inflammatory component that causes dry eye. If you live and work, which many of you, probably all of you that are listening today, do work in a low humidity environment, and that can cause your eyes to, the, your eyes, your tears to evaporate, hopefully not your eyes. The treatment for this could be as easy as artificial tears throughout the day. You could want something thicker, like a nighttime ointment. That is good for those people who are so busy throughout the day that they forget their daytime drops and they need to replenish their tears at night. There's anti-inflammatory medications like a cyclosporin. The difficult part about that is once you're on it, it's a little harder to get off that drop and not feel the dryness come back. Dietary changes, um, flaxseed and fish oil supplements. And lastly, there's a tiny little hole in each one of your lids that leads to a pipeline that drains to your nose. When we blink, all of our tears go down that pipeline. You can plug that pipeline up called punctal plugs with either silicone or collagen, and that will help keep your tears in your eye. The last thing is environmental changes. You could get a humidifier for your work area or your home or right next to your bed. Take frequent breaks while working on a computer. The 2020 is an easy thing to remember. Every 20 minutes, take 20 seconds to look 20 feet away, and it reduces eye stress and lets you blink a little more. I like to err on a little bit sooner. I say 15 minutes, take a one minute break, look 20 feet away, but it's harder to remember 15, 1, 20. It's easier, 20, 20, 20. And lastly, if you are really dry, move to Hawaii. It's great there. Myobomian gland dysfunction. So myobomian glands are 
located right at the base of your eyelashes. And there are these little pores that, when you blink, put droplets of oil up onto the eye. We have seen an increase in this thickening of oils, or less oil production, um, with those that are used computers, but also with age. Women of more than men, and if you have rosacea, that inflammatory component um, decreases the amount of oil that you'll produce there. This is a really hot topic for our aging population. Um, we think it's linked to hormones, and as hormones taper off, then these oils do as well. Um, they're trying all sorts of creams that maybe have testosterone in it. You can squeeze those glands, heat those glands, but this is a really hot topic for dry eye right now. Treatment, the easy ones, heat. You can take and put rice in a sock and put it in your microwave and lay it on your patient's eyes and it'll heat those little oils and get them to go. You can also lid massage very carefully with the pad of your finger and you close your eyes and kind of rub at the base of your eyelash to get those oils out. Antibiotic ointment for the reason that sometimes we have staph aura from our skin that will climb over our eyelashes and get into those glands and gum it up and you can kill those off that way. If you eat more omega-6 oils, you'll produce more oily tears. And the blepharitis component, which is that bacteria that can climb over, if the antibiotic ointment isn't getting you where you want to be, or it's persistent and it comes back, then you can add oral doxycycline, 50 milligrams twice a day for two to three months. It's, it's quite a long time to be on an antibiotic, but it does work. Next is your eyelid falling. You'll see a lot of our geriatric population that lift their forehead muscles to try and lift their eyelids. And sometimes it's because of gravity, and you'll see gravity pulling down, and they're trying to lift their eyelids back up. Sometimes it's because those muscles become weak or their tendons become loose, and they will actually need surgery to lift that lid back up. A lot of people feel like it's cosmetic, so some are afraid to say something. So while you're going through talking to the patient, you can ask them, I noticed that your lid is drooping. Has that been there for long? Is this something new? Did you want to do something about it? And quite often they will do take a visual field at their, um, their eye care provider that's unique. And it checks just the superior field. And if they're missing quite a bit of their superior field, now it is medical and they can have the surgery without it being under cosmetic. Entropian and ectropian. Entropian going inward, ectropian going outward. When you have entropian, it hurts. Your eyelashes are tucked in. It constantly feels like you have a foreign body. Your patient's eyes are red. They're watering. They hurt. They want their eyelids plucked, or eyelashes plucked. But really what they need is, is a surgery to move those back out. Ectropion is when the eyelid falls away from the eye. And it also can be very problematic because your tears constantly spill out onto your cheek. And a lot of people will get even a red line down their cheek, a dermatitis of, uh, from all of that kind of salty tear running down. And their eye gets very dry even though it is dripping. This is a picture of entropion. And you can see right in here, their lashes are buried. So they feel this every single time they blink. If we switch, here is ectropion, and that eyelid has fallen down here. Normally, your tears drain in that spot. But in this case, the tears are going to drain somewhere down here, and it spills out onto their cheek. They'll get crusty eyelashes, and the skin becomes sore. Common causes of vision loss. So all, everything we talked about up to this point isn't really vision loss. It's more of a temporary, very bothersome, but not really loss. When we get into cataracts, you can't see through the lens. It becomes slightly foggy and then gets more and more difficult as it develops. Glaucoma will, make, will give you blind spots in your visual field that are permanent. And age-related macular degeneration affects your central vision, also very vision debilitating. We'll start with a cataract. So once again, here is our eyeball. I'll move this. And that lens is this thing right here. That's the part that gets a little foggy. It is a loss of transparency. 
<laughs> there's another arrow. This is a cataract in the microscope. So let's move that to here. You'll actually see these white fibers in a dense cataract. It's difficult to look into the eye past the cataract. So imagine what it's like for the poor patient trying to look out through that. It is a gradual change. You'll try and correct their blurry vision because your patient will come in and say, my vision is blurry. And it, you can't get them back to 2020 with a vision with a glasses change. Their night vision is worse because their pupil opens up at night to let in more light and it hits more of the cataract, scatters all of their light and their vision becomes bad. And they'll definitely see glare, especially with this particular cataract. And if you see these little wedges, so I'll kind of trace them with this arrow, all the way down here, there's a clear spot in between these two wedges. And if the patient's seeing through a clear spot and those two wedges, it'll create multiple images. And that is that is really confusing, and it is a big reason why we take cataracts out sooner than later. Here is a normal lens, one without cataracts, but it has been jostled a bit. I'm not really sure how this patient moved their natural lens. But it has moved away from the center, and you can see this is what it's supposed to look. It's much more clear. There we go. Look at that. That's with the, the background illuminated, and you can see. Cataracts will come in all shapes and colors, and some are brown, and some are white, and some look like flowers, and others will look like spots. This one is really dense. This patient is not seeing a whole lot through that mass. That is a mature cataract. Now we used to say, let's wait for them to turn ripe, or they're not quite ripe. We avoid getting this far. Not only is it much more difficult for the surgeon to break their way through this rock or marble of a lens, takes a lot more energy, you'll get a lot more inflammation and possible side effects. So we take these out much sooner than this spot. But in your older population, you will hear them say, I'm not ready for cataract surgery. It's not quite right, but it's not quite bad enough. And we just tell them we need to give them their vision back sooner than later. These are some symptoms. It starts out a little foggy, gets a little bit more foggy, and even causes that double image. How do we manage this? Well, first off, we're going to start with glasses. We could do low vision aids for those people that really don't want to have surgery, but I would stick with the glasses first. If glasses aren't cutting it and vision's about 2030 or 2040, then we start talking surgery. Cataract extractions are pretty amazing. Um, some surgeons will boast under 10 minutes, others about 15, but no matter how you put it, it's pretty quick. Um, a lot of times there is not a stitch, and you'll use eye drops afterwards for two to three weeks. And considering that gives you your vision back, that's not so bad. We do take out the cataract lens and put in a nice, clear intraocular lens so that the patient can see after surgery. So these are pictures, guess this artist, Monet, in 1860. But here is Monet 20 years later. There's a difference in his paintings. He was probably suffering from cataracts. After cataracts, we get to glaucoma. This is another big one. And this is a very good reason to come in annually and get your pressures checked. You can't feel this. Your eye pressure is important. It keeps your eyeball round. If you don't have it, your eyeball would squish down to nothing. And so you just don't want your pressure to be high. If it does start to elevate, we will start doing further testing. But we also have to figure out why. There's two main causes. And one is that the fluid on the eye can't get out because it drains. And the other is that you're producing more than you used to. Here is a picture of the eye. So this, the white arrows in here are showing that the pressure is pushing on the retina, keeping that eyeball round. This picture is a drawing of the front surface. And when you look down into there's the pupil, right in the center. The liquid comes around the lens from the back of the eye and scoots its way up to the side of the iris. And there is a whole network of tunnels that the fluid can leave through the eye. Now, if somebody has been clocked a good one and they've had red blood cells or white blood cells, 
those can get trapped in those outflow channels, and that can be one reason that the pressures would rise. The other is that over time, um, it collapses on its own. So that can be genetic. But no matter how this works, pressure's rising, and it's pushing onto the back of the eye. It is influenced by many things. There's a diurnal variation that we all have. Um, the season, your heartbeat, your breathing. The medications that you take, beta blockers, can sometimes lower your pressure. Topical medications, some people use hydrocortisone on maybe an atopic dermatitis, and that can sink through to the eye and cause pressure increase. But body temperature does not, which is good. It's one of, <laughs> it stays pretty much the same. There's common types of glaucoma, two basically, angle closure and open angle. Angle closure is less common. It's very quick, and it's the blockage of, of everything leaving. The open angle is more common. It's much slower. And that's the one where your pressure increases with either increased fluid or decreased drainage. In a closed angle, it is an emergency. Your patient is in pain. Sometimes they're nauseous. And it needs to have surgery right away. They may not be seeing very well out of that eye. Um, the pupil's dilated. It does, it's fixed and dilated. And you can see haloing. The, it, it really is um, quite an ordeal. Open angle, you can walk around for years and years and years and years and never know you have open angle. And the vision in one eye will deteriorate before the other eye. And it deteriorates out in your periphery. So when you're, we have little spots in your periphery that are missing, you don't really notice. When it finally crosses over into your central vision or your other eye has similar spots missing, now those spots overlap and you see that you cannot see a spot. So that this is more gradual. This is the one. Um, it is irreversible. And so you do want to come in and get your eyes checked for that. These are some symptoms. So you have spots in your peripheral field that you cannot see. And that's what it would look like. It narrows your field of view all the way down. The, how we manage it is with eye drops, with surgery. And when you have glaucoma, you have to do follow-ups. You have to check visual fields, which is probably the most boring video game you'll ever play. You stare straight ahead at a dot. And when other dots are blinking, you click a little button. Eye pressure checks are fairly quick. And then we've got some great technology that will tell us the nerve fiber layer, how thick it is in all the quadrants, or 360 degrees around the nerve. That's very useful, very helpful. This is a normal retina. You can see this beautiful nerve right about there. It's nice, smooth blood vessels, clear macula, and this is pretty much what you see when you look straight through the pupil. This is not a normal eye. This is macular degeneration. And the picture you see is pretty advanced. In the US, it is the most common reason for blindness after the age of 65. We still don't understand it completely. But we have lots of theories. Um, one of them is UV light exposure the release of free radicals from that exposure, and then it oxidizes the retinal tissues. Another theory is the areas um, have decreased vascular perfusion, and it leads to cell death. Apoptosis, one of my favorite words, um, is that cell death. And we're still trying to figure out how to stop that cell death or prevent it. There's two forms of macular degeneration, dry and wet. The dry is the slower progressive loss of that central vision. And if you can see it, there are these little dots that are in the retina. That is drusen. And this is where that clumping is happening, where those cells are dying. And if one happens right in the center of your vision, the center of vision will, will decrease. Symptoms can range. They might not notice this at all, but when you look in the back of the eye, you see some. Um, blurred vision, and that's pretty common. Metamorphopsia is when things look distorted. Wh lines that are straight look wavy. And scotomas are actual spots that are completely missing. 
This is an Amsler grid. I love the Amsler grid. You give them this piece of paper and you put it on your refrigerator at arm's length and you close one eye or cover one eye and you look at the dot in the middle and as you're staring at the dot in the middle you ask yourself can I see all four corners? Are all the lines vertical? Are they straight? Are all the lines that are horizontal straight? And Am I missing any? If you can say that you can see all of that you do not have any new macular degeneration changes. This is by far the best way to track this at home. The treatment for the dry form is regular eye exams and talking to about family history there is a genetic component. You can educate them that the faster that they come in if they see a change the better off they will do. Sunglasses because of the UV protection is helpful. Um, antioxidants. There are some studies, the ARID study came out over a decade ago um, and it tells you that by taking these antioxidants there's some that are very specific to the eye you can help slow down the progression of moderate um, AMD. And stop smoking, which we still say, especially in our older population. Um, we'll see how we do over the next 20 or 30 years with that one. Here's the ARID study. So they took people who either are going to get it because of a strong family history and people who had it already. And they started feeding them these antioxidants. They did see, imp well, a reduction compared to the, the placebos that they had less vision loss. So they knew that they were on to something, they derived a supplement and this is what the first arid study supplement contained. They did find that there was a problem. Beta carotene in smokers caused lung cancer. So they ran the study again and they didn't have lutein in it. You'll hear about lutein in a lot. Um, they ran it again and they changed it a little bit, adding lutein, taking out barity carotene, and found that there was an increased benefit. This study was the most effective in people who had diets that didn't contain all these wonderful things. You can find lutein and xanthanine in natural occurring foods like spinach and kale. And if you don't eat that already and you start taking it, um, it shouldn't be surprised that that seemed to benefit. The smokers who took this new formula also didn't have quite as much um, lung cancer incident. Take home message for your eyes is eat your vegetables. Here's the ARIDS 2 formula. You can see beta carotene was taken out, lutein and xanthanine were added. Then we get into the wet form. This is quick, it's mean, it's not fair. You're going to hear all sorts of it really is depressing because they feel like they don't have control over this and their vision is going. Um, what happens is that there's many layers of the retina, but where the blood vessels are, they will pop. And a lot of times it's because the drusen on top of them are weighing them down and popping them. But they'll bleed and they'll separate the top layers of the retina from the bottom layers of the retina. And when the bottom layers do not receive that nutrition, vision can't get through, light waves can't get through there, it can't get to the brain and after a while that area tends to die and scar. Here is a few different clinical pictures of it. So this right there is a small bleed, there can be a network of little blood vessels that are bleeding. Here's the drusen we were talking about. Then you get into here and I wish I could make these bigger but there's kind of a soft gray look to this where that scarring is starting. And then in this one you can see that atrophy, there's scar tissue here, a new bleed up here. It really is, this, right in here is your central vision. Everything that you see in the center of your vision starts to go. The preferred treatment, well for me, this is retinal specialists. They're going to do the, the work on these people. Um, the photocoagulation, um, photodynamic therapy, and the surgeries, macular translocation, we try and move it a little bit. Those are all surgeries that kill off those blood vessels that are leaking. The anti-angiogenic drug therapy is probably done the most. And it was early cancer treatments to get the blood vessels to stay away from those tumors so they won't grow. And then they used it for the eye. And this has seen, um, I guess, the, it has given a lot of hope for um, keeping vision in wet in the wet form. Then we get into detachments. So 
So the vitreous, which is the jelly inside the eye that keeps your eyeball round, can actually shrink, and there's a current inside of it, and it can shrink and move. And as it shrinks and moves, it can pull on the retina, the little fibers can break, and you'll see this separation start to form, the liquefaction. And as that's happening, you might see little spots in your vision, little floaters in your vision. And if you see a dark spot, it is actually the shadow of that fiber that you're seeing. And if you're in a, it's usually on white backgrounds, bright sunlight, and you'll see little squiggles in your vision. They are normal, but any new floaters should be seen to make sure that it's not pooling on the retina. PVDs, they're 65% over the age of 65, so a lot of us have them. Um, there's a higher risk in people who are nearsighted because their eyeball is longer, it's been stretched, and women. Um, it is that decrease in size that causes this little floater to be seen. And when you're seeing those floaters, definitely go in and get checked, but if you're seeing flashes of light, that's more of an emergency because it's possible that some of those floaters in the vitreous are pulling on the retina and that retina is telling you that it's being tugged on. This is a retinal detachment or a picture of one. And if something pulls on the retina and it breaks, especially superiorly, then fluid can fill that and push the retina out or it can fold over your vision. This, if you see floaters and we see a little spot like this, we can laser that site, keeping it from detaching um, all the way. But if you wait and you wait until the floaters go away, and the next thing you see is a curtain coming over your vision, you have much less time to get surgery to repair it. There are different types of retinal detachments. Regimatogenist is caused by the break in the retina. Exudative is caused by the fluid that will accumulate underneath the retina. So kind of like a bruise underneath your skin, it, be, it lifts the skin, it would push the retina, and sometimes the retina falls forward. And tractional is when you've had bleeds and now there's scar tissue, and that scar tissue shrinks and pulls on the retina. This is an emergency. If you have a retinal detachment, it is quickly to your retinal surgeon, and I they are very busy people because they have to do surgeries right now and they will take all those patients and, and no matter what time of day they, they seem to be doing surgery. Um, highly nearsighted people have factors diabetics because of the bleeding and if they've had an injury an impact to the eye can cause the retina to detach. Treatment, we can laser that little hole back in place. Um, we can put a bubble inside the eye and have the patient lay face down and keep that retina up until it's, it's back secure. We can put a, a buckle, so think of a, a belt that you put around the eye and you tighten it and it pushes that retina back into its place. And then you can also put oil inside and that will keep it in its place. Here are a few diseases, quite a few diseases, that affect the eyes. And we'll go through a few of those in detail. Diabetic retinopathy is very common. I see these patients sometimes every three months, sometimes annually, um, definitely annually, actually. They don't feel bleeding. They don't feel when they have a spot that's not getting nutrition. The only time they will come in on their own when they say, you know, I can't see. We don't want to wait till that point because that means their diabetes has been going on for quite a while. This is one of the leading causes of blindness kind of in your younger generation, but a lot of our type 2 diabetics that, that go untreated for a long time, they'll come in with a retina that has this much bleeding. The retinopathy, you can see here, there's kind of a fan. And even at the nerve, there's all these extra blood vessels. What happens when we leak fluid is our brain doesn't like that. It knows that that bleeding outside of the vessels is wrong and it'll try and build new blood vessels to keep that blood inside. The problem is those new blood vessels are made in haste. And so next time you have a high blood sugar reading, your blood volume gets bigger and all those other blood vessels pop and now you have much more bleeding. This one is mild and it goes all the way through. Ah, no There's mild all the way to severe. 
this is the same phenomenon that happens towards the extremities. So remember that if you're seeing a lot of these tiny blood vessels collapsing and breaking and bleeding, that we should also ask them, how's your fingertips, how's your toes, and make sure they're getting the care um, at there as well. Symptoms of this, fluctuating vision, blurred vision, sometimes distorted, sometimes a loss, sometimes nothing. The treatment, number one, control your blood sugars. Um, when we need to, we're going to kill off those blood vessels that are leaking, and that's also with a laser. We can take out, if the bleeding, if those blood vessels have grown into the vitreous, we can pull all the vitreous out, getting rid of those extra blood vessels, and then putting that air bubble again, and hopefully um, keeping that retina as safe as possible. Then next is high blood pressure. High blood pressure, how I usually tell my patients about high blood pressure and how it affects the eyes, is I tell them, think about a garden hose. If you turn the garden hose water on full blast, the garden hose does this little dance. It turns tortuous. The same thing happens in the back of the eye where the blood vessels can get tortuous and they get enlarged because they're working so hard. And when blood is traveling very quickly through a tortuous vessel, sometimes it won't make the turn and it'll pop through the wall of the vessel and you'll get bleeding in this as well. These people also should have eye exams every year and we dilate the eye. We look for Narrowing the vessel, so if, if a vein is over an artery and the artery is becoming narrow at that point, then we know that that vessel is heavy. And if there's any fluid or any white spots, caught, called cotton wool spots, um, there can be a lot of, almost, almost like a lymphedema where the vessels are just kind of leaking into the tissue. And so you'll get this macular swelling that causes vision to get blurry and hemorrhages. So here's a picture of our hypertensive patient. Um, enlarged vessels, cotton wool spots, bleeding. They're not doing great. This one is, um, well, we've probably all seen it. This is herpes zoster, shingles, and it's shingles of the eye. If it's coming down to the tip of the nose, it's called Hutchinson's, Hutchinson's sign, and it, it doesn't mean that their eye is going to do well. Um, there's always a little bit more that goes into the eye when you see that sign. It's horribly painful. We can tolerate quite a bit of ne neuralgia on our skin, and you'll see that across the torso in many patients. But when it gets in your eye, the, it is not friendly. It causes scarring, and if they go more than three days without treatment, it's much harder to get ahead of this and keep from having loss of vision. So if you see that on the tip of your nose, there's a 75% chance of ocular involvement. If you don't have it at the tip of your nose, it drops to 10 to 25% of your patients. So um, watch for that in your patients. This is all the places that you can see um, herpes zoster ophthalmicus show up. Eyelids, it, it really starts out the front surface of the eye and goes all the way to the back, even to the nerve. You want to treat within that 72-hour onset. You can do orals, definitely do orals, and also topical antiviral eye drops. My favorite is Zergan. It does have a little bit of toxicity to the front surface of the eye. It's, it's a heavy-duty medicine. So artificial tears is also usually um, prescribed with Zergan. Um, very important to get it on the eye. These are some of the medications that affect our vision. And they affect them in fairly odd ways. But a couple of them, the top two, are for heart issues. Tamoxifen you'll find in breast cancer patients, so we're using that. Plaquenil is lupus. And prednisone is for a whole host of things, but quite often um, your rheumatoid arthritis patients. Digoxin. It's not used as much, I believe, um, but when it is used, it rarely causes eye problems. But what happens with your photoreceptors is that it changes the way that the sodium and potassium are, are taken in. And your vision gets skewed towards the yellow color spectrum. And so you really end up with yellowing of your vision. Your eyeball is not yellow, but what you see is more yellow. And that one, if, if you start to see that, then we can hope that there's another medication out there for you. 
Um, you can also get these little um, blank spots, scotomas in your vision. Not right in the center, but kind of right around that periphery. So if your patient is coming in and saying, my vision is yellow, it's blurry, or I can see little spots, you need to send them to their um, cardiac um, specialist. Then, and that one's annually. I will see these patients annually. Amiodarone, let's see if I can get our arrow here. Right, whoop, right in that region of the cornea. This is supposed to be crystal clear like window glass. This one is a lipophilic drug. It takes the fats and deposits them in kind of this whirl-like shape on the cornea. Shockingly, patients can't really see this in the mirror, and it doesn't affect their vision as nearly as much as you think it would. This is also reversible, which is fantastic. So if you do see this in the, in the microscope, you ask the patient to talk to their cardiac specialist again, see if they can go on something else, and this tends to go away. Um, it doesn't affect color vision like digoxin. And this one is about every 6 to 12 months, because once it does start depositing, it does take a few months for that to go away. And if they do have some vision symptoms, um, months of blurry vision is tough on a patient. Here's tamoxifen. It's tough to see those little dots, but right in here there is a disruption in the retina, and it does cause some vision changes. This one is a tough one because the, you know, do you go off tamoxifen and risk breast cancer? Or do you have some vision ch vision changes? So this one is uh, is tough, and a lot of these people who are on toxin don't want to hear any more bad news. So you do have to be a little careful. Um, they've gone through a lot to get to this point, and but you need to talk to their internal medicine doc and let them know that you are seeing some changes in the macula, which is your center of vision. The the dosage the higher the dosage, the more likely you're going to see retina and corneal findings. The lower it is, it's much less likely of 1 to 2 percent. That's pretty low. Um, but you still want to make sure that you're looking for this. If a patient's on 180 milligrams a day, you're going to probably see them every six months. But if they're on something that's lower, like a 20, then annual is just fine. Plaquenil, if you look here, there's my pointer. That's the macula. And there's this ring that occurs around the macula. This is used for patients with arthritis and lupus, and sometimes um, certain malaria infections. It does cause a decrease in vision. It does cause color vision change. And when you look into the microscope, you see that bullseye maculopathy. There is visual field loss, and there is decreased contrast sensitivity. Contrast sensitivity is a tough one, because if this is also in your older patients with cataracts, that also decreases contrast sensitivity. But that's when you see light image and dark image, and they don't stick out quite as much as they used to. In-office testing is visual acuity, which is most likely decreased. Um, you'll have central vision loss when you go into that really boring video game test and you click the little button. Your color vision will do this for everybody um, that is on this medication, especially the blue-yellow spectrum. You dilate and look at the macula for any swelling and that bullseye maculopathy. And then the OCT. Oh, I love this. This machine's amazing. This is the one that tells us the cellular layers and how thick they are and if there's any swelling or leaking. It is truly amazing. It, it'll pick up things far before my eyes will see it in the microscope. This isn't quite standard of care, but what should be, and it's hopefully getting there, that we take one of these OCT scans um, for patients that are on these medications that will cause changes to the retina. And then you could do a multifocal ERG. Not a lot of offices, hospitals definitely, but not a lot of um, clinics out there will have this. Flaquinel. This one also causes um, some changes. And this one is a permanent change. Um, usually, if they're on a lower dose, you're not going to see vision problems, so the yearly is just fine. But if they're on higher doses, you're going to see them every six months, sometimes sooner. And talking to the physician is key. Sometimes the vision changes are so subtle in the very beginning that the patient can't even put their finger on it. 
but and you might look at the at the macula and it looks completely fine. These little deposits or changes are deep inside the retina, and if we can catch them with an OCT, um, then we can take the patient off that medication and switch to something else. Here is um, steroid use, so oral steroids. It can cause cataracts, and this is a picture. It's tr it's the light is coming from the inside of the eye, so it's illuminating the back surface. And on the back surface of this lens, it looks like somebody took a little chisel and chipped away at that nice clear window glass, and you're left with looking through that. And it distorts vision, and if you get one of these, cataract surgery is the only way to treat that. Lastly, oh, I'm leaving a lot of time, um, when to have eye exams. So the annual exam for healthy individuals is just fine. And if, it's, if you have something that's even controlled, we still want to take a look at the back of the eye and see if the blood vessels are changing or if there's bleeding out where you can't feel it or see it. All right, we're up to our true-false. Do you want me to read these for them? Sure. Okay. So presbyopia affects distance vision. True or false? Number two, dry eye is more common in females. True or false? Number three, the Amsler grid is a tool for monitor monitoring cataract progression. True or false? Flashing lights and vision can indicate a retinal detachment. True or false? And lastly, glaucoma is a painful eye disease. True or false? The people who hmm? are watching this are not going to see those. That gets posted onto our oh, website. Perfect. So you can go okay. through the answers if you want. Oh, sure. So presbyopia, um, it's all about the near vision. And, um, and that's going to slowly change from the age of about 40 to 60 or so. Um, dry eye is more common in females. That is true. And once again, you'll see a ton of research come out about that. Uh, the Amsler grid, which is that little square that had all the lines and the dot in the middle, is that home tool for monitoring uh, macular degeneration. So that is false for cataracts. Flashing lights in vision for number four can indicate a retinal detachment. That is absolutely true. And this is one where you send them to a vision specialist right away. And then lastly, glaucoma is a painful eye disease. That is false. You can have full-blown glaucoma. This will age me for sure, but Kirby Puckett was a Twins player, um, baseball player. And he went out for a fly ball and covered one eye with his mitt and found out his other eye was blind. That was very advanced glaucoma, but he didn't feel it. There you go. And that, the end. Okay, so um, first question has come across, what is the dose of fish oil and flaxseed for dry eyes? Well, the debate is out there, and it's anywhere from 1,000 milligrams, and the hardest part for your older population is going to be the size of the supplement. The pills are huge. Um, I tell everyone they can go up to 4,000 milligrams. Don't start with 4,000 milligrams, because it makes your entire digestive system a little slipperier than you're used to. <laughs> And if you are on somebody, somebody with blood thinners, um, more fish oil, less flaxseed oil. Um, flaxseed oil at higher doses, dosages can be a blood thinner as well. But start your patients out with 1,000. I do know that they sell flaxseed oil in a brown glass bottle that you can take by tablespoon, kind of like the old castor oil. And that is, um, the measurements are on the bottle for how much 1,000 milligrams would be. So while we're waiting for other questions to mm -hmm. come across, I have a question, and that sure. is, what about LASIK surgery in older adults? Well, diabetics, no, because they're not going to heal quite as nicely. Um, then cataracts are, are a big reason we're not going to do cataract surgery, or to do LASIK surgery. Because when you remove a cataract lens, and you take that out and put the brand new implant in it, we're going to you calculate the power needed for that length of eyeball curvature of cornea. So most surgeons are absolutely nailing that distance vision so that they don't need glasses nearly as much after cataract surgery. So 
if you start, a lot of patients in their 40s, especially because their vision's changing and they want something better, will ask about LASIK surgery. And I usually tell them, you're still going to need glasses. And cataract surgery is coming down the road. And that one will also fix your, your distance vision. And as this technology gets better and better, we'll be able to fix distance and near vision with a cataract, a, a new lens implant. And have the criteria for um, having cataract surgery changed? It used to be they had to be really bad before. Yeah, that has definitely changed. That's the ripe, you know, wait for it to be ripe. We don't do that anymore. Um, there is a requirement, though, when it comes to insurance. 2030, 2040 vision is right when we start talking about cataract surgery. And 2040 vision is a legal limit to drive. So we have a lot of adults that have cataracts that are at that range that are still driving to work, still working, and we need to remove those so that they can see. Mm. Um, the other part to that is that if you wait a long time, it is it takes a ton of energy to get in there and get that cataract mm. out, and so your chances of complications increase. What uh, does the evidence say regarding rumors that lutein works better for men than women? <laughs> I have heard the same thing, but I have looked and looked and looked, and I have not found any research that's backing that up. So yes, um, it'll be interesting to see if there's, because now there's a smokers and non-smokers supplement for macular de degeneration, and it'll be interesting to see if there's a men and women divide as well. Um, sounds like really good shelf space for those marketing people. <laughs> How does marijuana help glaucoma? Uh, you know, I have heard that for seven minutes, one hit will lower eye pressure. Now, it does lower eye pressure, and so that's great. Um, but I think to lower it for the entire day, you're going to be, that's a lot of hits of marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> so I think topical eye drops is probably better. Any questions, please? Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of Hispanics, and they have these prodigiums. Trigiums, yes. Now, that's not exactly an age-related thing, but it, I, is it an environmental thing? It's being outdoors and the wind and stuff causes it? It is. So the question is, um, a lot of Hispanic patients have pterygiums. And pterygiums are a growth that's starting at the white part of the eye, and it moves on to the cornea. Before it gets to the cornea, it's called a penguecula. But once it gets on to the cornea, if it continues to grow, it will obscure vision. And if it's a thick amount of tissue, it presses on the cornea, distorts vision, and it's even hard with glasses prescription to get that clear. Um, this happens to a lot of patients who are in wind, sun, dust, sand, salt water. Um, surfers, um, when we, we lived in Hawaii and all the surfers had them, both of them. You can get a surgery to remove it. And if it's obscuring vision, I would definitely do it. It used to be that there was a very good chance it was going to grow back. But now there are ways where they can block the growth. So they might take a sample of tissue and, and lay it perpendicular to that growth and stop it from regrowing back onto the cornea. But if you don't change your environment, then it's still going to irritate the eye. And the eye is basically bracing itself. It's trying to cover and protect the eye from all of these elements. Um, but yes, any people, like people who are out in the fields, they need to be wearing some sunglasses that will cover the eye and keep it protected. And if it gets irritated, you can in, get an inflamed pinguecula and artificial tears and a mild steroid eye drop is very nice. Another question. Yeah. Now, just so I have a little idea what's happening, mm -hmm. when do you get cataract surgery? Now, I take it your initial, your own natural lens is flexible and moves with your muscles or something and focus. I, I thought that's how it works. I'm not sure. Yeah, let me go back to cataracts here. Oop. It's catching up. We'll get there. You're asking how does it work? Well, the ones they put in there, are they flexible too? So our lens, when we are a little kid, let's take a 10-year-old. That lens it looks about like the small, a small M&M, and it is very malleable, and you can squish it and make it thicker. You can thin it out. When you squish it to make it thicker, 
you can see better up close, like a magnifier. And what happens when light comes through it, it makes it so it's less flexible. So now it's becoming firm, dense, a little thicker. The lens sits in a baggie, and that baggie has little bungee cords that attach it to muscles. And so you can, when it's firm, you can pull and pull and pull, and you can't get that baggie to squeeze that lens enough. So you will hear that they're, oh, just do eye exercises, and you'll be able to see up close better again. And that's not quite the case. Um, when you take that lens out, you are leaving the baggie there. So the, right where the white of the eye meets the color part of the eye, there's going to be an incision. And you can go in, make a small incision in that baggie as well, basically pull out the lens. We break it apart with um, ultrasound, and so the pieces are small and will fit through a small incision. And you take those out. Now the baggie's empty, and you can place that brand new implant. It's curled up. You put it in there and you flatten it out and has little haptics to hold onto the baggie. But even then, that baggie has now been changed as well. And so you can pull and nothing happens. So that lens does not really flex as much as, as that lens when we had when we were 10. They're working on it, though. Um, they're trying to figure out how to get this lens a little more flexible so that we get our near vision back with that distance vision. Yeah, currently they do a multifocal that has different parts to the lens that lets you see up close and far away. A lot like a bifocal. So the, the one lens we're putting in there is geared for a certain like infinity or whatever. Right. Geared for it, so it's yep. not yep. like, I guess, what a young person, what a young person has. And there is, you as a patient have options when it comes to the cataract, the implant that goes inside your eye. If your entire world is in front of you, and you've been nearsighted all your life, you're used to being able to see up close, you can ask the surgeon to aim for a nearsighted prescription. So you can take your glasses off and see great up close, but you're going to need glasses for your distance vision if you do that. There's also patients that have put monovision multi, uh, monofocal, so distance eye, near eye, surgically in their eyes. I would tell you never to try that unless you've done it and have been successful in contact lenses. You should trial that always before you get it done surgically. We'll get to the, I'm so going to show you where that lens was. Oh. Cataract surgery is truly amazing. If you ever get a chance to watch one, it'll take about 10 minutes of your time. And it is really incredible what we can do now. So maybe in this one you can see Right around 360 degrees around, there's this small attachment here to that baggie, and it tries to flex this lens. In fact, I think in the subluxation, well, kind of, there's a little bit of a remnant of the baggie in here. But mm -hmm. that, that controls that lens. Are there any concerns with using artificial tears more than four times daily? Nope. Nope. You can't really overdose on artificial tears. Um, you can become more dependent on them. And I should qualify this with, if your artificial tear says get the red out or anti-itching, that's not just a lubricating eye drop. And yes, you, it, the vasoconstrictor that's in there, it's works. It really does. If you want a white eye for pictures, grab some of that anti-red and, and it'll be a white eye. But it's not fixing the problem. And so you can keep taking and keep taking and your eye will feel dry. So when the blood vessels are enlarged, it's telling you that the cornea is not getting something. And usually it's lubrication that's necessary. So I would, I would avoid using those chronically and, and switch to an artificial tear. But then also find the root of that dry eye. Is it because my oil glands are plugged? Am I, is my lacrimal gland not producing enough liquid? Should I plug those puncta so that the tears stay in the eye? But you, if, if patient's coming in and they're using the artificial tears hourly, every two hours, it's time to figure out why their eye is dry. Do you recommend eye caps or 
looks like Preservision or other eye supplements. That's back to that Air Red study. And so Occuvite and Preservision were the, um, they were the ones that came out with the study. And so a lot of times I'll tell the patients, you know, this is tried and true. These are the companies. There's many other companies that are coming out as well. And I, and I'm, I, I don't have any affiliation with any of them. But I would say as long as you have that Air Red study and you can see exactly what you should be taking, then I would look and see if, if the eye caps or whoever else you're looking at has them as well. But that department has blown up. Um, it's very confusing for our anyone to walk down that aisle and try and figure out which eye supplement to take. So you can tell them that there's many out there. It, you can try them. But yes, I tell my macular degeneration patients, even the ones who have it, a strong family history but don't have, don't have any signs yet, I will tell them, it doesn't hurt. Take it. And I usually start that in, in the 50s. OK, well, I don't see any other questions. I don't see questions being written. OK. Um, Oops, so, here's one. Oh, yep. Do you have any concerns with using artificial tears with preservatives, or should only preservative-free eye drops be used? That um, is very similar to our contact lens solutions. Um, preservatives keep you from having any bacteria growing in the bottle. And preservative-free are those individual vials. And to tell you the honest truth, preservative-free is fabulous. You're not going to get a reaction to pre preservative-free. But it's also really expensive, especially for a patient, an older patient who's taking them you know, every couple hours. With the individual vials, you twist off a tube, and you keep it upright, and you can use it a couple times, and you toss it. If it falls down, you have to throw it because it could be contaminated. So the bottles are very nice. It's also easier if your dexterity isn't quite there um, to take off a larger cap. So I don't tell my patients that they have to be preservative free. What I do tell them is that they've tried a brand and they're getting a pinkish eye, it doesn't quite feel right, to switch to a different brand, a different preservative, and see if that one is agreeing with them. Some patients, every single preservative is a no, and so then preservative free is their only option. That's a great question, by the way. What is the rate of complications with cataract surgery? Oh, boy. I haven't seen the latest rates. Um, personally, in clinic, I would say that about, well, almost everybody has a little bit of inflammation afterwards, which is an iritis or a uveitis. That's white blood cells that are floating around because you've just had surgery. And that's why we're on a steroid eye drop afterwards. The type of complication is that pressure increase from being on a steroid. And that's right around that 7 to 10% range. When it comes to other um, complications, a secondary cataract, which is, a, is not really a cataract at all. It's a membrane that starts to grow around the back of the implant. That is a little higher. That's almost in the 40% range. And it can happen within a few months after surgery. It can happen a few years after surgery. But what is annoying for the patient is that you have to wait for this membrane to grow all the way across the back. Because then you can laser down the middle and it pulls open like curtains. But if you, if you don't have that nice tight traction, it doesn't do that. And so you have to wait. And that, that can be pretty annoying for the patient if it's not growing fast enough for them. Um, but other complications, if you, we tell the patients to be very careful the first couple of days after surgery. I like to joke with them a little bit that downhill skiing in my 70-year-old patient is kind of out of the question. If you're going to take a face plant, water skiing, avoid that for a couple months. Um, but try not to take a fall. Um, when you have bad hips and, and um, arthritis, you just tell them to kind of lie low for at least a week, let that eye heal, and, and those sutures are in place. For them. Yeah. What are the um, contraindications for cataract surgery, if any? Well, is age ever? No, but some, you know, this kind of gets into the more technical parts. Um, if if someone is really heavy, some you have to be careful on where you are are laying them. You know, right now we do a lot of in and out of the office procedures with these cataract surgeries. But sometimes you'll need special equipment for your patients. Um, so you have to take that into consideration. 
Um, there's certain things that can happen to the lens inside the eye that make it trickier. There's a pseudo exfoliation where the, the baggie that holds the lens is kind of losing some of its width. It's, it's shearing off. And so it's very easy to push down on that cataract to try and get it out. And the, lens, the, the capsule falls apart, the baggie that holds it. Um, there, you know, people like Marfan syndrome patients, they don't usually make it to this age, but um, if they do, same, those zonules, those bungee cords that hold on can also let loose. So there's all these little things that we watch for. Um, I would say in your, your general population, I wouldn't worry about those situations. I would let your retinal or your cataract specialist, your eye care provider, search for them, ask those questions. Um, but the biggest is to let them know that you know, if we continue, your cataract's going to get worse and your vision's going to decrease. We need to be doing something about this. Mm -hmm. When you were discussing the diabetic retinopathy, it seemed mm -hmm. like it, some of what you were saying looked pretty similar to the uh, macular degeneration. Let's see if I can. There are different processes, yeah. It, diabetic, um, I don't know if I can get to the right. Oh, well. Um, with macular degeneration, so the question was, macular degenera degeneration and diabetic retinopathy look very similar. A lot of them do. Hypertensive retinopathy looks a, a very similar as well. But in diabetics, you're not going to see the macula get attacked first. It's often in the periphery. And it's usually where you'll see a bifurcation of blood vessels, and these tiny little blood vessels will have these little dot blots. Truly, in the very early signs, it looks like somebody took a red felt tip marker and just put a few little dots on the, on the retina. And at that point, it's more about educating your patient. Look, your blood sugars are too high for what your body can handle. And maybe they have a 6.3 A1C, but their body's not handling that. So that's another part of medicine. We've got these guidelines, but sometimes even when you're meeting the guideline, you're still seeing retinal issues. So I definitely write a letter to the primary care physician and say, patient reports this A1C, if I can't see their labs already, um, and, and say, I'm still seeing diabetic retinopathy. Something is going on. The worst combination would be high blood pressure high blood sugars, because now you have a lot more blood traveling through really little spaces in high pursuit, and so you'll see a lot more hemorrhaging that way. When it comes to macular degeneration, I, dry is more common. I see a lot of dry. There is a lot of wet out there as well, but you'll see these white little deposits in the center of the vision, the macula, and sometimes some vision complaints. Wet isn't usually the first step. And so you've seen these patients for a little while, and then they develop wet. So mostly it's the area of the retina that you're seeing these changes. One other quick question. Mm -hmm. I think you were saying every six months through the uh, dilated exam. And some individuals. Or yeah. The question was um, in, on one of the screen or one of the slides. It said to see patients for a dilated exam every six months. Those are the patients that have progressive eye disease. Even if they're controlled, we still want to check them at that six-month time period. So patients that like Plaquenil, they're on Plaquenil. Um, if they've had a couple little hemorrhages. We're going to see them back three to six months after we see them the first that first initial visit. Um, but we're going to monitor a little bit more often. For a healthy individual, or they've had very stable cataracts, very stable mac dry macular degeneration, then you start getting into the annual again. But like for the diabetics, they're not. Oh. We're, we're seeing ours that we're doing that every year. Is that, is that the community standard out there for diabetics? It, it is, so the question was, um, do we see diabetics annually for eye exams, or is it every six months? If, if you have not had retinopathy, it's annual. But if you have retinopathy and it's new, we're going to be seeing you three to six months later and continue to do so until we either see them disappear, stabilize, that kind of thing. I see 
a lot more hemorrhages at a right about that 15 year mark from when they were first diagnosed. That's their blood vessels have been through a lot at that point. There's a lot of expanding and shrinking to keep up with that blood. So, you know, they may have been stable that whole time and nothing much has changed, but they'll start to get hemorrhages. And so they'll go from being seen annually to now every six months. Yeah. What is the long-term effect of sitting in front of a computer screen for eight to 10 hours a day? <laughs> um, well, globally, we're seeing a lot more nearsightedness. And especially in our younger population, you might have genetics that tell you you're going to be a little nearsighted, so your eyeball is going to grow anyway. But now you have this environmental factor that tells you that you're only using your near vision. And we're so adaptable as human beings that our brain will elongate that eyeball even more. And that's so that you don't have to flex your eye muscles to see the computer screen. Now your focus, your, your natural focal point is there. The problem is now you can't see in the distance. And so you come to see your eye doctor and she gives you glasses. And you see great in the distance and you have to focus to see up close. And the brain gets that feedback again that you need to see better up close. And you can still elongate. We thought this was only for younger populations, but we're even in our 20 and 30 year olds, we're seeing this little bit of nearsightedness every one or two years creep in there. And, and a lot of times right after college, because they're starting this job that's eight hours behind a computer. Um, dry eye is a big one. We're not blinking. And so we, the oil glands start to dry up, and people have dry eye. Um, you're going to see accommodative hysteresis, or where your muscles spasm. They're looking at the computer. They're stuck there. And when you go to drive home at night, you can't see anything on the road. But then when you wake up in the morning, miraculously, your distance vision is fine. And that repeats day after day until you're either getting bad headaches and you come in to get computer glasses to alleviate, alleviate that strain, or your brain elongates your eyeball and you can see better in the distance, or you can see better up close and not in the distance permanently. And, and that's the other part. This is permanent change. So um, I preach that take those breaks from the computer. And if you find that you're one of those people that you're so focused, you don't ever look away from your screen all day long, that invest in a pair of computer glasses, a really, really mild reading glass that allows your eyes to have some relaxation while you're staring at the computer. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good.